the second class today for Saturday University. Uh, change subject, change discipline. We're going to uh, talk about art and exhibiting art and what does it mean to actually have art uh, in the public world, in, in, in our lives. Um, and our speaker, uh, second speaker this morning is going to be uh, Susan Muldenauer. She's the director of uh, the University of Wyoming's Art Museum. Um, and as a director, um, she comes to us as an art exhibitor, okay? And at uh, the museum, she has primary responsibility for overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of about a 50,000 square foot museum. Uh, she is in charge of making sure there are exhibits in it. She develops educational programs. She is uh, managing and overseeing the acquisition of new items into the collection, the conservation of the collection and its organization, and so on and so forth. Um, and if you've ever come down to Laramie, you'll discover that we always have about three or four different exhibits going on at different times. Um, and they are organized by Susan and her staff of curators. A um, couple of ones that Susan takes great uh, pride in um, are recent exhi exhibitions by Peter Sarkazian, who did, uh, does video art. Um, and this was a, a mid-career uh, perspective. And uh, this is something that's organized uh, with uh, the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Korea, and we'll be traveling there. Um, and uh, she's also organized uh, an exhibit called Sculpture, a Wyoming Invitational, which is a, a collection of outdoor uh, sculpture exhibits that was throughout Laramie uh, for about a year, year and a half or so. But that would only be half of Susan's story. Uh, when Susan organizes these exhibits, she does it with an artist's eye. Uh, because she's an artist in her own right, uh, this is just one sample of uh, Susan's uh, photography. Um, she's developed a wide repertoire and is widely known. Uh, she, her work is on exhibit uh, several times a year over the last, oh, I would say probably two decades or more. Uh, sometimes in individual uh, exhibitions, sometimes uh, being exhibited as part of groups. Uh, her photography is collected by a variety of museums and uh, private collectors. Uh, so she uh, really uh, brings both kinds of perspectives, the sort of art administrator's perspective and the artist's perspective to her work. And with that, let me introduce Susan Muldenhauer, who will speak on public art and community, building partnerships through art. Susan. Good morning. So I am going to talk about public art today and why it's important and what we've been doing in Laramie um, and give some examples about what things have been um, going on around the country. So simply stated, what is public art? I had this question a number of times last night at dinner. Um, very simply, we could say public art is any work of art or design that's created by an artist specifically to be cited in a public space. But I think we can talk about public art in a much broader capacity than that. It really has um, much more dynamic impacts. It attracts attention. Its presence can heighten our awareness, question our assumptions, or express our community values. It has the power to engage our public spaces, arouse our thinking, and transform the places where we live, work, and play into more welcoming and beautiful environments that invite interaction. Public art can engage strangers in conversation, encourage children to ask questions, and calm a hurried life. It enhances the quality of life by creating a heightened sense of place and introducing people to works of art that can touch them and generate for generations to come. It transforms a city's image and can define a community's identity. It can be a unifying force. So beyond the personal experience of encountering public art, we could say public art is a true symbol of a city's maturity. It increases community's assets and expresses a community's positive sense of identity and values. It demonstrates unquestionable civic and corporate pride in citizenship and affirms an educational environment. 
A city with public art is a city that thinks and feels. So how do we fund public art? I know this is another question, and I think we could say that there are a variety of ways of funding public art. Um, it can be designated through local, state, federal government grants and um, funding sources, but it also creates opportunities for a number of people to be engaged in helping to make public art happen through public art percent programs, public agencies, the general public contributing directly, um, individuals, educational institutions, museums, hospitals, corporations, and foundations. So I think we could say that public art is a community-wide mission with no boundaries for participation. So what I'm going to do today is to um, show you a little bit of um, public uh, art in the, from the past, and then I'm going to talk about what we've done in Laramie. So we're going to start in Chicago, which is my hometown. And I remember very distinctly when the Picasso um, was unveiled, and it was quite controversial at the time. Um, nobody could identify what it is. They couldn't tell what it was made out of. Um, it was very large. Um, this piece uh, is located in the Daly Plaza. It's in the Loop, what's known as the Loop in Chicago. And it was the first monumental modern sculpture placed in downtown. It is made of Corten steel. It's 160 pounds, 50 feet tall. Um, Picasso, the artist, never visited the city. I, found this, I find this really interesting. He never visited the US either. But he designed the piece for Chicago. Um, it was um, fabricated in Indiana, but he was never paid for the piece. He made it a gift to the city. Its design and everything that has happened with the piece um, was a gift to the city of Chicago. It was unveiled in 1967. So after a, a, an initial very controversial um, uh, response from Chicago, at, at some point, things began to change. And I remember seeing the first images of um, the uh, Chicago Cubs baseball hat sitting on top of the Picasso sculpture. And all of a sudden, things started to change. And Picasso became um, immersed into the identity of the city. 40 years later, well, excuse me, um, Shortly after this was unveiled, Chicago passed a percent for art ordinance. And 40 years later, there are now dozens of outdoor sculptures to be found throughout the city. So we see something that begins as a very controversial um, piece, tr transforming a city into really embracing um, art. Millennium Park. How many have been to Chicago since 2006? Did you visit Millennium Park? Did you get there? Um, Millennium Park, I think, is a really um, transformative um, um, accomplishment for the city of Chicago. It's really revitalized downtown. It's made people come into the city to experience all kinds of things. Uh, so the park uh, is located on 24 and a half acres in Grant Park, which is in the loop, downtown Chicago, opened in 2004. It incorporates sculpture, um, gardens, a fountain, a performing arts center, restaurants, it has an ice skating rink, and so it's a year-round place for people in the city to come and engage with art and be part of the city. Um, this first work is by Anish Kapoor, and I would say it's the centerpiece of Millennium Park. Um, it's referred to lovingly as the bean, which I guess it has kind of a bean shape. Um, it was inspired by the artist's desire to do something to reflect the city's skyline and sky. And so um, uh, Anish Kapoor made a 110-ton elliptical sculpture. It's made out of uh, highly polished stainless steel. You can see um, it very much does accomplish what he was trying to do. It reflects the city. It reflects the skyline. And it also reflects the people who are there to engage with this work of art. Uh, in the middle, uh, you can see a 12-foot high um, gateway. It's called Cloud Chamber. And there, so there's a gateway that, uh, in, so that you can actually walk into this piece. And once you do, this is what you see. The inside is actually um, pushed up almost to the top so that th that reflective surface reflects everything um, bouncing back and forth. And at the very top, that very circle at the very top, you can begin to see yourself looking up at yourself looking down. And so um, it's, a, it's a completely mesmerizing experience. Um, if you get there and you haven't seen the piece, I highly recommend uh, doing that. One of the other key features at Millennium Park is called Crown Plaza. This is by James Plensa, a Spanish artist. 
and um, get rid of this. And um, Plentz's work, called Crown, Crown Fountain, is an interactive fountain. There are two tall 50-foot um, glass block towers that are um, video, have video projections of a 1,000 faces of Chicagoans. And the faces are done in a way so that they um, very slowly come to um, a point where they spit out water. And the water comes into this very shallow, um, I wouldn't even call it a wading pool. It's a very thin, maybe an inch deep um, surface of water that's very um, flat. And, and it's obviously in the summer a place where kids gather and uh, cool off in the heat of the summer. So the, the idea of this water coming out of these faces is reminiscent of the tradition of gargoyles and fountains where they're sculpted into that point where the water comes out of their mouth. The same thing happens with these um, faces. So the, um, the wading pool is about 230 feet long. There are two towers. Here's the other one. Um, these are my colleagues from a museum association meeting. We went to visit um, Millennium Park when we were there. But you can see, this gives you a sense of scale. These are not small pieces. They're very large. And, um, and they really are another part of the centerpiece of Millennium Park. Lurie Garden is um, trying to, again, put nature, bring nature back into the city. And so there's a garden that has um, a 15-foot high hedge that encases the garden, protects a perennial garden, and, um, and there's a hardwood footbridge that divides the garden diagonally. One of the other really major accomplishments in Millennium Park is the um, Frank Gehry band, new band shell. And this band shell, um, you can see this trellis structure in front of it. The band shell is created so that uh, with a state-of-the-art sound system so that you can be seated in the um, very end of the park and it sounds like you're in a, a concert hall. The sound system in this structure is state-of-the-art, the only one of its kind in the country. So the Frank Gehry um, portion of this is the very recognizable a winding ribbon in the distance in this piece, and then this trellis system holds the sound system. There are 4,000 chairs for people to be seated, and beyond that, there's a large enough lawn to seat an additional 7,000 people. So 11,000 people can sit and enjoy a high-quality, concert hall-quality performance um, in the park. So let's look at New York City for a minute. New York City has a public art um, fund, and um, it really works with emerging and accomplished artists of all levels of um, recognition. They produce innovative exhibitions throughout the city with the goal of having New Yorkers and visitors encounter art on a um, regular basis. It was founded by Doris Friedman, the first director of the Cultural um, Affairs and president of the, of the Municipal Art Society. In 1977, um, it was established as a nonprofit organization, so they work through private and, and public funding. And to date, they've presented over 500 in installations commissioned by artists. Um, the image that you're looking at is uh, Olafur Eliasson, who a few years ago did a project called the New York City Waterfalls. And what he did was to um, create four of these waterfalls under bridges or along the, um, the riverway in four parts of the river, um, Lower Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Governors Island. They're 90 to 120 feet tall each. They're constructed from traditional scaffolding for buildings, and they're, um, they have a pump system so that they're recycling water from the bottom um, up to the top, and then the water falls back down again. There were um, concerns to protect life, the uh, fish and um, um, and other animals, and so there's a grading system so that it wasn't capturing fish and giving them a little ride that they didn't really want. Um, so they were very cognizant of that. They also did a lot of education uh, programs with this so that um, school children and others could understand more about New York, its natural environment, um, conservation issues, uh, recycling, and um, energy issues, and those kinds of things. 
Um, the, the really fun part of the New York City waterfalls was the fact that you could see them up by foot, by bicycle, and you could also take the New York City skyline um, boat tour, which is what we did when we were there. And so um, these images um, are two that I took that gives you an idea of putting um, a waterfall or nature back into this very industrial environment. So I would just um, add that for this project, the Public Art Fund partnered with government agencies, environmental organizations to examine or to develop materials that examine the waterfront through art, history, environmental responsibility, aquatic life, ecology, water conservation, and other subjects that the young and old could relate to. Moving to Philadelphia. In 1995, Philadelphia um, passed a per, uh, per, per percent for art ordinance for the construction and remodeling projects through city uh, funding to ensure that there was sculpture in the city. They commissioned artists for these works. They were selected through a call for artists that, and a process that included an independent selection panel, uh, artists, community representatives, architects, and users of the facility. Um, artists were selected based on merit, technical proficiency, and relationship to the site. To date, more than 300 works have been created or um, placed in Philadelphia. Robert Indiana's Love Sculpture is probably the, um, the central piece of that collection. It was initially placed in Philadelphia on loan and um, eventually purchased and donated to the city. And then the stainless steel um, pedestal that you see here was added later. Perhaps the most interesting and um, um, recognized public art program is, is the mural arts program in Philadelphia. Um, this program started as a response to trying to um, take care of a graffiti problem that the city was having. And they decided to try and get the graffiti artists to uh, transfer their skills into something that was more positive and conducive to a community environment. So um, they, <coughs> excuse me, they hired Jane Golden, who was a muralist, to work with the graffiti artists and begin to focus their energies into something very productive. And she was very impressed by not only their raw talent, but by their understanding of art and art history, and decided through them to begin to specifically place murals within communities and neighborhoods in Philadelphia. They added color, beauty, and life to an old industrial city, struggling with decades of economic distress and population loss. The results have been transformative. Um, in 96, Golden became the director of the Mural Arts Program, which was previously called the Anti-Graffiti Network. She also simultaneously, I think this is very interesting, established a nonprofit organization called the Philadelphia Mural Arts Advocates. So this is the fundraising arm of the ability to do the mural program in Philadelphia. Today, there are 3,000 murals throughout the city, and I would say that most of them are as big as you see here. They are stories high, large, and completely impressive. Uh, we, I took my board there a few years ago, and so the images I'm gonna show you are from, they have a little trolley tour. It's an open-sided trolley that takes you through all the neighborhoods. And so as you're photographing the murals as you're going through. Everybody in Philadelphia greets you and says hello to you. It, and the city of um, neighborly love is really that. They're, they're truly um, excited about this program in their city. It trans has transformed their city. So the murals give a voice to tell individual and collective voices in neighborhoods. It passes on culture and tradition. It's a vehicle to develop local leaders and engages thousands of at-risk children, youth, and adults who find their artistic voice, develop self-confidence, and discover new ambitions through the mural arts program. It's been recognized, um, its art education program has been recognized as a model for the country, and it has a prevention and prison program that also has served as a model. Um, uh, Philadelphia is now designated as the city of murals. I'm gonna show you uh, perhaps five or six of what they look like. This is Frank Sinatra. <laughs> you 
You can say that the, they're stylistically different, the palette is different, um, no two are alike. I love this one because of the juxtaposition of subway, it really gives a sense of scale to it. And that's also relief. There, some of them have very distinctive relief forms. There, some of them are made out of mosaic. Um, they're really, really a quite remarkable experience. So if you go to Philadelphia, take the mural arts trolley tour. Um, it's an hour and a half long or, or a couple hours, and it's well, well worth it. So I want to talk a little bit about art on campus. Just like art can transform cities and communities, art transforms campuses. Um, funding on campus is generally the same as in, in um, public forums. It can be uh, through the university itself, through state mandates, and of course through um, the philanthropy, generos generosity of philanthropists. Selection processes on campus vary widely and are usually guided by mission statements or collection concepts. Um, there's, an, there's a publication called Public Art Review and in uh, 2009, they listed the big 10 of college campus collections. Um, I'll just read off to these who they are. Uh, Arizona State University, Johnson County Community College, MIT, Pratt, Texas Tech, University of South Florida, Washington State University, Wichita State University, University of California, San Diego, and University of Minnesota. I'm going to show you um, a couple of slides from just three of these to give you an idea of um, the different ways that they're structured and how they're funded. So what you're looking at here is a work by Anthony Gorm uh, Gormley called Still Standing. It's um, a bronze work in the Johnson County Community College collection. I believe it's in their library. Um, Johnson County Community College has a mission to cultivate an awareness and appreciation for the visual arts. And what they've done is embrace contemporary art. They've had um, a, a couple, Marty and, uh, what's her name? Marty and, and Tony Oppenheimer. Um, initially, we're placing large scale sculpture, art, uh, sculpture on campus. And um, through the 90s, their campus grew significantly, and they began to plan for a new museum of contemporary art on their campus, which opened um, five or six years ago. And in the process of doing that, they expanded their mandate to bring art not only uh, into the outdoor places on campus, but into the interior areas on campus. And so the Oppenheimers put together another 100 works of art specifically to be placed in interior locations. So if you go into the, um, the dining halls or the library or the corridors in buildings, you will find museum quality public art in all these places, all contemporary. Uh, the Stewart Collection at the University of San Diego, California has been um, recognized as an innovative program where the Stewart Collection um, is able to use any location on campus for, as a future um, commission place for art. And how that works is they have a, a selection committee, it's reviewed by the, um, by the campus, and it's, the final approval is by the chancellor of the university, but the Stewart Collection is separate. And they've, they've been known for the last 20, 25 years under the direction of Mary Beebe um, to do just really extraordinary commission work for campus. What you're looking at here is Jackie Ferrara, and she's really known for working in places like corridors and um, hallways and connecting areas between buildings. She works with architects and artists to um, create these spaces that are then um, um, commissioned and placed in place. Now, Jackie was brought into the University of Wyoming as a consultant for the new Prexies Pasture when we were redesigning the central part of our campus. She came in as a consultant on that project. Um, and so she's really known for doing these kind of connections, unifying spaces through, um, through art. I would just mention that um, other artists in the collection at the Stewart Collection include Terry Allen, John Baldessari, uh, Jenny Holzer, Robert Irwin, Barbara Kruger, uh, Bruce Nauman, and Nam June Pike. So finally, I'm going to talk about MIT and their, um, their program. 
MIT um, believes that great universities have distinguished art, architecture, and landscaping. This is one of their most recent installations. Uh, it's by Saul LeWitt, and it was, um, it was unveiled posthumously. He died before it was uh, completed. But they believe in using um, contemporary art as a vehicle for presentation and analysis and to investigate the world. So they wanted to enhance and enliven their campus with, uh, to make it into a visual environment and to encourage daily and content, constant content with art. In 1963, the first commission by Alexander Calder called the Big Sale was made possible by a private donation. In 1968, they passed a percent for art program to set aside funds to commission new art for, um, for campus thereafter. Other major works of art include um, Pablo Picasso, Bernard Vinet, Michael Heiser, Jennifer Bartlett, Mark de Suvero, and, and Henry Moore, all made possible through gifts, loans, and purchases. Um, the Saul Witt is what you're looking, it's a little hard to tell, but what you're looking at here is a floor. So this is a floor that connects an old building and a new building. Um, it is terrazzo, and it's uh, typical of Solowitz's work where he would do what I would call variations on a theme. So there are 18 of these large squares using um, primary and secondary colors in varying patterns. And then the unifying factor becomes the gray and, and white borders that you see around each of these squares. And what you're looking at is about a third of the entire floor, which actually is a U-shape if you look at it from, the, from an aerial perspective. So let's talk about what we've, what we've been doing in Laramie the last few years. Um, in, in 2007, we learned that our galleries would be closed for a period of time because we had um, uh, to replace our fire suppression system. And so knowing that, and knowing that we didn't want to close the museum for a year, um, we decided to figure out a way that we could bring the museum out of the galleries and into the public spaces on, on campus. There had been a lot of talk I, over the last decade before that of trying to get art on campus. Nobody quite knew how to do it. And I thought, well, maybe here's our chance to respond to a community need and to address a problem that we had in terms of being closed for a year. And so we decided to do um, an Art on Campus exhibition. And, um, and it is that. It's not a public art program. It's not permanent. Um, everything that we put up was, was put up temporarily. Um, some of those pieces remain, and some of them um, are, have gone. So the first thing I did was I went to President Buchanan and said, I'd like to do this, and I really need your help and support. And he um, happily and gladly said, do it, you know, whatever you need to do to make it happen. So we started the partnership on this project with the University of Wyoming. And the agreement was this, that, um, that I would curate the show, that we would have a campus committee that would help cite the, the pieces, that the museum would raise the money to um, either commission the artists or bring the artists in, bring, get their work to campus, and as soon as it got on campus, preparation of the site security and um, insurance would be covered by the university. And so um, I started to work on that and we um, ended up with, um, I think, 12 works on campus. Um, and then I thought it was also a chance to begin to talk with Laramie. Um, I've been hearing that the city of Laramie also wanted um, sculpture, they wanted sculpture downtown. Um, there was not a unified collection of um, a committee that could actually make that happen. And so I went to the Laramie Beautification Committee and I, and I invited them to join us in the project by doing the same thing. I would, bring, I would identify the work in the artist, I would get the work in the artist to Laramie. As soon as it got uh, into our community, they would take over preparing the site and caring for the piece during its duration. So from um, May through August, we put in uh, 18 works of art. Uh, there are, I believe, four from our collection that, are, that um, now are enjoyed by the public. And there's one, um, there's one work that was made by um, a local organization called ARC, and this is an organization that helps um, adults with um, learning disabilities. And they had just opened a fine and performing arts center. And I thought, what a great way for them to be engaged in this exhibition is to have their um, clients, their artists, 
create a, lar a, a large work of art for the, for the outside of their new building. Well, they were terrified by this idea because they were used to working eight by 10 inches and I wanted them to make something perhaps eight feet tall. Um, but they took the challenge, they went to the Arts Council, they received a grant for um, funding for materials and they put together, I'll show it to you here in a minute, they put together um, a work that was inspired by Alexander Calder and it actually is, it's large enough to walk in. Um, and I think this was really transformative for, for these artists that they could actually accomplish something that seemed insurmountable to them. So I think some of the stories that can happen with working with local artists, working with art in the community can be really um, magical and transformative. So let me show you um, a little bit about what we did here. Um, this is a map, I know you can't read it, but it'll give you an idea of how we spread sculpture throughout our community. So um, you can see I-80 um, that kind of surrounds Laramie and all of the black lines point to a location for sculpture in Laramie. Um, we, we ended up not with just one work off campus, we ended up with, what, five or six, which I was t completely thrilled. Um, this is Prexy's Pasture. We decided to use this, the core center of campus as the central point for the exhibition. Um, we had conversations with the, with the committee about, you know, do we want to spread it out over campus? Do we want to make it something that's all in one place? And they really felt strongly that um, for a couple of reasons, we should, we, should put, we should concentrate all the work in this one location. Um, Prexy's Pasture was recently um, redone and reopened as a pedestrian, walking, livable space rather than as a parking lot in its previous iteration. And so um, we were really proud of that and wanted to um, make use of that. And we also thought that if we, had, if we spread these works ac across campus, you wouldn't really get the sense of an exhibition. It would be, um, there weren't enough to really have a concentration to make you kind of connect the, the dots between uh, what we were putting up. So we decided to do Prexy's Pasture as our location. And I started working with uh, locating artists. So what I'm gonna do is um, show you the exhibition of the originals, which opened in 2008. And this is as if you're driving in from Cheyenne, I'm gonna kind of drive you through. You could do this on, on a bicycle, you could do it, um, I guess if you're really a, a, a long distance walker, you could walk the whole thing. Um, we had classes uh, on bikes that went out and used the exhibition in the classroom. And we did a walking, driving tour guide for this. So I'm just gonna show you what the works look like. And then, I can, then I'll tell you a little bit more about them. So this is John Henry at the easternmost at um, the rec center. Uh, Deborah Butterfield, I know you all know her work. There was a show here not too long ago of her, of her work. This is in the museum. Also in the museum. Uh, Jesus Morales from our collection. It's on our terrace. And then we asked Jesus to come back and create a piece um, specifically for the exhibition. So this is the beginning of Prexy's Pasture. Still in Prexy, so we, we used Prexy's pasture as, a, as a, the walkway around it as the walkway around sculpture. We placed everything out towards the edges so that it wasn't taking up um, space in the middle where we knew students played frisbee and did all kinds of um, activities. So we really placed the work around, that way we had handicap accessibility also. Um, a work from our collection that we placed in the president's office. Uh, this is out by the classroom building on 9th Street at our public library. Uh, Robert Russell in one of our parks. This is from our collection. Also from our collection. This is the work that the artists at ARC made. Um, you know, to have them come up with something that was um, as monumental as this for their new building was, was a truly extraordinary. This was in one of our parks on the west side. I wanted to be sure that we did not 
overlook the west side of Laramie, which um, has been overlooked for many, many years for a lot of reasons. And then the last work is by Steven Siegel, who was out um, in our Greenbelt area. And so here are a number of the artists. We, we um, brought everyone back, almost all of them came back, to do a two and a half day symposium uh, about six or eight months after we opened the exhibition. And so um, here you see from left to right, uh, John Henry, Linda Fleming, Stan DeLiga, Jesus Morales, Chuck Parsons, Ursula von Riddingsvard, and Steven Siegel. So um, we're artists from Laramie and all across the country. The symposium, by the way, is available. We've recorded it, and so uh, on our website you can go and you can see everyone's presentation for two and a half, that was two and a half days long. Um, so I'd invite you to look for that at some point when you're ready. So some of the impacts. Um, the Art Museum, for the last, well, I guess, 30 years since we opened, we've been doing a student juried exhibition. Um, in the last 10 years, we started not acquiring um, work for the museum, but we started having work purchased by administrators and um, others for campus. And so by now, we, when you walk into almost any um, department on campus, you'll find student art sprinkled across our campus. We also were asked, when we started doing this project, we were asked by the, the new conference center that went up to help them work with putting art in, in the conference center. So when you walk into the, into the conference center side, you'll see an exhibition of photographs that are all by Wyoming artists that depict, um, I would say, known and unknown aspects about Wyoming and our um, state. The, li the library, um, with their new expansion, a couple of things happened there. They wanted to, do, um, to bring art into the library, and I think they've done a remarkable job. You go anywhere in the library now and you'll see art from local artists, students, and more. And what this, what this image is, is the installation of a James Searles piece. Now James was in the um, sculpture exhibition and it, synchronicity of a number of things came together that we had the money to actually commission him to create this work that's on permanent view now in the library. Um, when you come to the library, if you go up to the fourth floor in the new building, um, you will see um, what's called rolling flower suspended in the atrium there. And it's truly a stunning piece and I think a, a remarkable accomplishment to have our campus begin to move into the realm of, of not only putting art in our, in our buildings and on our campus, but to do it in a permanent way. We've also worked with the College of Business. We know that the College of Health Sciences has put art in there. A new building and the College of Law, um, working through a local artist, Joe Arnold. Um, created uh, an exhibition that um, over time has been purchased for um, permanency on campus. So we're really seeing the impact on our campus of art coming into our daily uh, lives, which is really, um, I think, a, a grand accomplishment. Within Laramie, I think um, some of the things that are happening are that uh, there are a number of groups. The Laramie Beautification Committee obviously is interested in putting art in, in our community. There are other groups. Um, we now see the um, uh, city council putting aside a little money for art in the community. That wasn't even a conversation 10 years ago. So I think we're seeing the beginnings of the momentum of things starting to happen. And it's uh, really gratifying um, to see that we're, we're making some progress on bringing, I think, um, some really interesting works into our community. So I want to end by sharing with you a little bit about um, what we're doing this summer. One of the challenges with the sculpture exhibition is, of course, it was all temporary. We did it, we pitched it as a temporary exhibition because um, we knew that if, if nobody liked it or nobody wanted it, we could take it away without a lot of trouble. We also didn't have to raise the um, necessary funds to purchase and maintain the work if it wasn't permanent. And so um, working through, um, I had a, a, an off-campus committee and the campus committee working with me. Working with the campus committee, we've had conversations about, you know, how is this going? Is it really important to campus? Should we keep trying to keep the exhibition going or should we just let the, the loans run out and it'll disappear? Well, some of the loans did run out. Some of the artists work, um, Patrick Doherty and Steven Siegel, who did temporary um, um, pieces that were meant to be temporary. 
um, have disappeared. And um, so we've decided to try and keep adding a few pieces every couple of years and see if we can at least keep the momentum going for the exhibition. So this summer, in July, coming here in about three weeks, um, Chris Drury is a, um, one of the hallmarks of land art artists from Britain. Uh, he's, been in, he's been working this way for 30 years. He did a site visit with us earlier this year, and he's coming to campus for three weeks in July to build this piece. It's called Carbon Sink, what goes around comes around. It's going to be made out of Wyoming coal and Wyoming pine beetle, uh, um, beetle kill pine. And the diameter, it's a little hard, this thing looks like it's floating up there, but the, the size of the piece is actually 36 feet in diameter. So this is not a small work of art. And it's to be located just southeast of Old Main. There's a big uh, area there that we know people play frisbee and walk their dogs there. So we're putting it off to the side like we have before. Um, but Chris will be here for three weeks to build the piece and we're working through physical plant, facilities planning, um, to make everything come together and hopefully work out um, well. So if you come to Laramie any time after July 11th, make a point of stopping by near Old Main and um, seeing Chris uh, make progress on putting his work on our campus. And this piece, you know, we said three years. He said, you know, it may last 20. We'll see. Um, Jerry Saylor is an artist from Idaho, and um, she recently did a residency at Gentel, one of the residency programs here in Wyoming. And I received um, some information about her work before she came to Wyoming for her residency. And I said, you've got to come to Laramie and talk to me. And so she came down to Laramie um, because I was thinking maybe it's time to go from looking at outdoor spaces on our campus to indoor spaces. We have so many new buildings going in with, with beautiful atriums and large public areas in those buildings that could accommodate art. So I thought maybe Jerry would be a really interesting addition to this exhibition. Um, what you see here is hot glue. Her material is hot glue. And she works in her kitchen. She um, puts ice water in her kitchen sink and she strings this hot glue in it. It immediately freezes or cools down and is um, permanent. And then she wraps them up and creates these installations. So the site that we're looking at is in co-library and part of the new building. When you, when you walk in, to the right there's a, a new coffee um, shop. To the left is a new computer lab that has a beautiful two-floor um, area, um, viewing aspects from the second floor and the first floor and surrounded by windows. So we're, we're planning on installing this piece in August um, in co-library and we're looking um, at it as a three-year piece. And so um, this is the second thing on campus that we're uh, trying to do this summer. Funding, um, I should mention funding. Funding for the original exhibition was, um, was accomplished through grants and through the efforts of my uh, National Advisory Board and through significant support from the University of Wyoming um, Office of Academic Affairs and President's Office. For these two exhibitions, uh, we had an anonymous donation um, given to the museum that was unrestricted and we decided that it was time to um, put funds towards continuing the sculpture exhibition and then we also received funds from the Wyoming uh, Cultural Trust Fund. So again, multiple funding sources to make these kinds of programs happen. Um, the other thing that I thought that I would do was to go back to the city and see if they wanted to also continue being part of this um, exhibition and the overwhelming response was absolutely. And so I went and I spoke with, um, with the Beautification Committee and um, with the Rec Center. And um, what, I kept, what I kept hearing was, we need something downtown. We need something downtown. Um, and, I, and I haven't quite been comfortable thinking about putting sculpture downtown. We've had a little vandalism on campus with the works we put up. Um, but I really felt <clears throat> like we were not quite ready to put a, a big um, sculpture downtown. And, there's also not a really wonderful place to put a large sculpture that would be, that would contribute to uh, our downtown environment. And so earlier this year, um, we received funding from the Wyoming Arts Council. They have a new program called the Community Arts Partnership, which specifically funds collaborations between art, art programs and communities. And we have funding from the Patricia Guthrie Foundation, which is a local foundation in Laramie. 
um, and, and then the um, Laramie Beautification Committee. So we have three funding sources to try and do something in Laramie. And as I've been talking and thinking and looking at this, um, what I kept hearing was murals or um, art and gardens. And I thought, okay. Well, there's one area in Laramie um, which we now call the Foxhole. And it's the former site of the um, Fox Theater, which is on 2nd Street, um, just south of the Cowboy Bar and north of Jeffries, if, if you know our, our downtown at all. And a few years ago, we, um, the city took down the building. It was asbestos filled. It was a pigeon haven uh, and a real eyesore. And so that building is now down. And it was replaced with a gravel lot with um, a fence and barbed wire on it. And so it's a, now it's a really beautiful location. <laughs> and so the thing that kept coming back was we need to do something with the foxhole, but it has to be temporary because there are future plans of perhaps a developer will come along and want to put a building there. Or, you know, the, uh, Laramie Main Street is one of our partners in this project, and they've come up with, um, they've done a, a, um, a study to find out what the community would like here. And part of that response was gardens and art something to do with the arts. And so um, one of the artists who had been on our um, sculpture campus committee when he was a student, Travis Ivey, um, I, also, I knew that he was also involved in some graffiti art. And I thought, well, maybe I could talk to Travis and figure out you know, what might be possible in Laramie. And so um, working through Travis and working with some of the other local artists, okay, um, We've now put together a proposal that we're working on. We're hoping to do this in July, um, where we're, it's not the foxhole, but it's adjacent to it. There's, it this is an area uh, of three buildings surrounded by a gravel parking lot. So this is the uh, co-op. This is a proposal from Talal Coker, who is a local artist. He's from Africa. He's done um, street art in uh, Africa, in New York City, and now in Wyoming. So this is his actual proposal. And from what we've heard, the co-op loves this idea, so I think this one we'll be um, proceeding with. This is the back of the Cowboy Bar, a proposal by another local artist named Megan Meyer. And then uh, from Travis, a proposal for the south side of, um, it's a glass company. And, um, and his work is inspired by Martin Johnson Heed, who, who was the um, Hudson River School painter known for beautiful floral and bird paintings. And so he's really uh, trying to do something that kind of brings back a 19th century uh, nod to our community. So we're hoping that these three projects and possibly two others also happen this summer. And I guess I'll stop there because Paul stood up. Um, and I'll, I, th I think we have a minute for questions. Yes, we have about uh, six minutes for questions. And if you'll direct them to Susan. And Susan, if you could restate the question so we can I'll try. <laughs> uh, that would be great. Yes. Susan, when you saw this mural graffiti art, I'm curious, has there been a decrease in graffiti? The question has to do with um, the Philadelphia mural project and if um, the graffiti problem has continued or not. Um, from what I'm hearing, there's been little to no um, problem with that, with the new murals that are up. And in talking with the artists in Laramie, um, because we've talked about this too with what we're trying to do this summer, are they going to get tagged? Is there going to be graffiti on them? And what they've said to me is, as long if, if since we're here, we will take care of it. And as soon as you, if there is a problem, as soon as you get rid of it, it won't happen again. And there's some kind of understanding there among the street artists about how that works and how that should work. So the, so the problem has been resolved significantly in uh, Philadelphia. I think they're not seeing you know, isolated graffiti problems. They're seeing that energy focus into those murals. And part of the way they've done that is through the way they work in communities and with um, collectives of artists in the communities to make those things happen. So there's community pride and community buy-in. So it, they've, they've really eliminated that issue. Yes. So as happened in Philadelphia, the artists that did murals were local artists. Do you feel like, and I feel like in Laramie, it sounds like artists are coming in to do the work. Do you feel like it's important to have the community itself create the art because it's been a true reflection of what the community wants and what the community feels mm -hmm. about art? 
Um, the, the question has to do with um, working with local artists versus um, bringing artists into a committee to do work. Um, I would say a couple of things to that. With the, um, with the exhibition, um, I wanted to include local artists, which we did. We had Stan DeLiga, who lives in Laramie, and we had the artists of ARC um, do that. And Robert Russell was also a faculty member, so he would be considered a local artist. And throughout my career as a curator, I've been really interested in trying to bring in you know, emerging with accomplished artists or local artists with national artists. So that's just a part of the way that I approach curating an exhibition. But with this mural project, these are all local artists. There's no artists coming in from outside Laramie. So we're really moving into that idea about a local community art program using local artists and um, making, making those transitions for the community through people who live there. Yes. Um, when you were in New York City, did you have an opportunity to uh, uh, witness and check out the Lower West Side elevated train transformation that they're doing? I did. Um, I was there last August, and um, I think it's remarkable what they've done. This is a, an old elevated train that runs, I don't remember where it starts, but it ends up down in the warehouse district? Or? Yeah, the warehouse district. It starts up the Right, and, and it's kind of interesting because it's hard to find. <laughs> I've, we found it hard to find. There are a few ways to get up on it, but once you get onto this thing, they've, done, they've used artists to transform what used to be a railroad line into what's now, what is now a bicycle, walking. You know, you get this elevated view of the city. You're not at street level. There's um, areas of grasses and prairies. They've, there are the old terminals that they've um, commissioned artists to do public art in, and I think it's remarkable. It's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating new experience, I think, being in New York. Do you have any thoughts or comments on the proposed project to cover sections of the Arkansas River with cloth panels? <laughs> <laughs> the Cristo project? <laughs> You know, I, I know that his projects are always controversial. I really hope it happens because I think that, um, you know, again, he works temporarily. The piece would be up for probably two weeks. Um, and it transforms a space and it makes us think differently about a location. Um, so I really, I hope that he accomplishes that. I know he's been working on it for probably 20 years, um, like he does all of his projects. But I, I really hope to see that it, it does happen. We've got time for one more question. Oh, can I see uh, some of the art in Laramie it was only for like uh, six amount of years? Mm -hmm. It's like mostly art in Laramie can be replaced or is it for some of the like, permanent? Um, are you talking about the exhibition that we did? Yes. This is a question about the permanency of art in Laramie. Um, everything that we've done with the exhibition called Sculpture Wyoming Invitational is temporary. And we've extended some of those loans, so some of those pieces have been up now since 2008, and they'll continue for another few years. Um, we keep reevaluating and deciding whether we want to keep the work up that we can. Now, a few of the pieces were made out of materials that um, one was taken down. The piece of the Greenbelt, Stephen Siegel's work, was taken down after one year. It was that was meant to happen. Um, Patrick Doherty's piece, which was with a kind of hut-like structure on Prexies. Uh, that one lasted two years, and he said it would probably last two years. But what we're, what we're doing with this exhibition, which again I would stress is not a public art program, it's an exhibition of public art, is temporary works. Um, what I really wanted to do was to have our community have a chance to see what kinds of art might, should be considered on a permanent basis for Laramie, and then have the community begin to develop a program to make that happen. So we're, we're trying to introduce new ideas about art in our community through this exhibition.